I always say this, if God will compel you, you will comply, but you will never choose. The fact that you have a calling doesn't mean you fulfill it. You cannot force a calling. You don't choose your calling. You don't choose uh, what resources should be at your disposal. This is, this is what your work with God is. It's a journey of adjustment. So what we did was necessary to get to where we are now. Mm, yeah. Yeah. This is important because you can't say you are spiritual if you do not pray. Because prayer is simply that bridge where we refuel, refire, and reignite. Mm -hmm. There are people that when they minister, all they sing is other people's songs. It's not a bad thing to sing other people's songs. But how do you get to the point where you trust your own sound? You trust your own teaching? You trust your own message? You trust the voice of God in your ears? How do you get to that point? Intimacy. Your voice also comes from clarity. Clarity of the things that God will have you do. Welcome to the new conversation. I'm your host, Dave Vilkal. This is the space where we talk about multiple things that are plaguing our world and bring perspective, the beauty of perspective, into thought and ideas. Scripture says that let your conversation be indeed without covetousness. That means every conversation should strengthen, edify, and build up. Just by talking, I trust the Lord that he will breathe upon the things that we will speak and someone will find answers. With me today is a brother who I've known for so many years, a fascinating individual, someone called of God, I mean, with the power to change the status quo. His name is Ezra Chongo. He hails all the way from Zambia. He's a psalmist, he's a man of God, and he's a businessman as well. Welcome with me, my brother, Ezra Chongo. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Um, well, so fascinating that I got the opportunity to be here. I mean, we've done so much together, and this just happens to be one of those ventures, so I'm excited. We're going to go on a journey from spirituality to priesthood and arrive at calling. The Bible says, to whom he did predestine, he also called, and to whom he called, he also justified. So that means the beginning of every calling is predestination. He said to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 1, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you and ordained you a prophet unto the nations. So it all starts and stems from predestination, right? So, but I want us to explore spirituality before we go into that. Spirituality has been misunderstood, misconcepted, and taken to be what it is not. Man has a tripartite nature. He's a spirit that has a soul and obviously, you know, lives in a body. It's not one or the other. I think... Um at the basis of spirituality is a relationship between you and God. Yeah. In the most simplest form, spirituality begins with you understanding this very fact that you have a relationship with God. One. That's the first thing. So through that process, then you begin to build on that relationship. I think if an individual can see it that way and they can see it as such, then they begin to naturally, if you have a relationship with someone, it builds into something else. Yeah, but you know, when you're talking about a relationship with God, you know, God doesn't speak to our bodies. Yeah. God doesn't speak to our minds. Yeah. God speaks to our spirit. That's why I said to you that the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. The, the, the part of us that has a relationship with God is our spirits. Yeah. And I see people wanting to have a relationship with God in their mind. God, is, you, you cannot relate with God in your mind. Your mind is too vast. Your mind is too dense. Your mind is too minuscule to understand the magnanimity of his splendor. So what God does is that his spirit speaks to our spirit. Scripture says that his spirit bears witness with our spirits, yeah. that we are sons of God. So it is spirit to spirit. Yeah. So if a man does not understand what it means to be spiritual or neglects the fact that he needs to delve in more into his spiritual inclination, that man cannot possibly have a relationship with God. Yeah. You can't have a relationship with God just intellectually alone. Yeah. You can't have a relationship with God physically by going to church or being in gatherings. That is not enough. Mm -hmm. It's not enough. It's not enough. We need to understand that it is the spirit to spirit connection. Jesus spoke in parables all the time. I mean, we studied the teachings of Jesus. He used earthly allegories to explain heavenly verities. Mm -hmm. So he says that the kingdom of God is like a man. That means spirituality is not something that is too abstract. It is also something that is relatable. Yeah. Jesus said that the kingdom of God is like a man mm -hmm. who went and bought a field. So the kingdom of God is like a man who 
through a party, invited people. The kingdom of God is like a man. Do you get it? So I feel there's a relatability. First of all, I think with what you've mentioned about the spirit, the soul, and the body, I think it's important for us to know that our body is, it basically works on automation. Okay. Just the same way um, the mind sends information and the body acts likewise. Yeah. So it is with the spirit. Whatever happens in your spirit, it translates to the soul. The okay. soul is, you know, the bridge between your spirit and the body. So whatever interactions happen in the spirit, they have an effect on the soul. And it is what is rich and present in the soul that has effect on the, on the body, body the which body. inevitably has an effect on the environment. So when we, when we talk about spirituality in Africa, I'm from Africa, he's from Africa, different parts of Africa, but I'm from the real Africa. You know, Nigeria, that's where God comes from. That's the spiritual headquarters of the world, Nigeria, in case you don't know. It's actually Lagos. Lagos is the spiritual headquarters of the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> hallelujah. That's also a, just, just a joke, but it's also true, but it's a joke, all right? Don't miss the joke and get the point, or miss the point and get the joke. Get both the joke and the point. Glory, glory to God. So the thing is, the thing about spirituality in Africa is they want to work it from the outside in. You see, but life begins from the inside out. If you break an egg from the outside, it's the end of life. You just killed the chicken, all right? But if you let an egg break itself from the inside, it's the beginning of life. So it's not about from the outside, like we talked about, starting to try to worship God with your body. Then try to arrive at an understanding in your mind and then having a spiritual connection. It doesn't work like that. It begins from the inner stimulation of the spirit, the influencing of the mind, and the acting out of the things that are predominant in the mind. Because yeah. out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth usually speaks, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So tonight, I mean, today we're just gonna go deep and deep and deep and deep. So if you are still here, buckle up and take time to share this, this, this broadcast or this podcast. Subscribe, like, leave a comment. Whatever it is you think, whatever you want to interject, questions you want to ask, probably things that we'll do, you know, more episodes that will come up and who you want us to, to bring on the show. I, I believe that we have the resources by the aid of the spirit to have absolutely anybody on this podcast. So my brother Ezra, yeah. talking about spirituality, we also have to deal with prayer. Yeah. This is important because you can't say you are spiritual if you do not pray, because prayer is simply that bridge where we refuel, refire, and reignite. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's, that's what prayer is. Now, Paul says something very fascinating. Paul says, I will pray in the spirit, and I will pray in the understanding what? Also. also. Now, also simply means in addition to. Whether we like it or yes, you don't pray in your understanding and in your spirit also. Mm -hmm. Paul gave us very clearly, I will pray in the spirit. Are praying the understanding also. That means it's the spirit that bets the understanding. Mm -hmm. So we start from the spirit. So what people don't speak in tongues. They say, I don't understand what is praying in the spirit, or all of these things. How does someone who doesn't even speak in tongues begin to pray? The relationship with God, how does it start? Okay, yes, I accept I'm a spirit. Thank you very much, I'm a spirit. Blessed be the name of God. Many of the many of pastors who you know meet me online, you know, fascinated by what I do, and then have the opportunity to meet me personally. And when they meet me, they realize I'm just, I'm normal. I'm natural. I'm not a spirit. <laughs> you know, because there's a connotation of what a spirit is. And, you know, one guy came to my house and I was cooking a goosey soup. You know, one of my pastor friends, Elijah, you know, I just said to him, bro, how far now? More chop. And that was it. You know, it's not like you come to my house, then I off the lights, then there's blue light everywhere. And we start praying the Holy Ghost. So spirituality is already misconstrued. So how does someone even begin prayer? I, I will say this. Um, I always wondered, because I always felt like I needed an organic relationship with God. Yeah. Right? And spirituality should be organic. It is. But it I be. feel like there is a transition from mechanical to organic. I feel like we are at one point or stage of our relationship with God. Usually in the beginning, it's often mechanical. That means they have to tell us when to pray. They have to tell us how to pray. Our Father what in heaven. They have to give us books. We recite. They give us songs to sing. And I feel like the, usually the beginning stage of our relationship with God is very mechanical. And okay. foundationally, I think it is important for it to be that way. Um, just as a child grows, you know, you teach it how to 
crawl, you know, it goes through those stages before it can arrive at a point of being independent, yeah. so to speak. So it will be mechanical in the beginning. You know, um, I don't... So it's okay when someone has to set a timer to study the word. For sure. It's okay if someone has to, you know, put an alarm to study the Bible, has to I be compelled, cajoled to go to church. But it shouldn't end there. You are saying that it should, it should happen like that to a point Until where... it transitions to being organic. Now, you're talking about transitions. That's, that's also something we we'll talk about in this, in this podcast a lot. Transitions are focal points where the old, which was once the new, changes into what is now the new new. Mm -hmm. All right? And that transition always seems like a depletion in your relationship with God, where, while in actual fact it is just transition. Mm -hmm. Because in transition, you have to be one leg in and one leg out before you are two legs out. That's what transition is. If I'm turning, my gaze is set on here, and if I'm turning in this direction, I slowly move in this direction while keeping a foothold on where I was, what I knew, how I did what I did. So when I'm turning, it always seems like we are leaving God behind. I know what I'm talking about. We'll, we'll go through that as we go. Sure. For example, there was a time we used to pray. I mean, we lived in the same room for many years. I mean, the same room, not just the same house, the same room. And we prayed hours on hours, five, six, seven. It was the time we went to the mountain to pray. We prayed from 9 p.m. till about 5 a.m. in the morning. Just labra, dila, skelebre. I mean, non-stop, just charging our spirit, as you may, you may say it. But now we, we, we necessarily do not need to do that, but we are constantly in prayer. Scripture says, pray without ceasing, which means without stopping. Now, I didn't just get to that point. There was a man of God who said that, I can't remember the last time I prayed 30 minutes on a stretch. But he also said, I can't remember the last time that I spent 30 minutes without praying. Mm -hmm. So you can see that these are two entirely different perspectives. These are two different stages in God. Just to add to what you said, I think, like I mentioned, there, there is a transition from mechanical spirituality to organic. So what we did was necessary to get to where we are now. Mm, yeah. So if we hadn't done the things we did then, we wouldn't be in the well, position yeah. we are today. So I th there's that transition from being mechanical. You know, just like something becomes a habit, you do it often, it becomes a repetition, and then you do it and do it and do it. And then you get to a stage where you begin to partake of his divine nature. And that's where that translation happens. Because like we said, Ooh. man is a tripartite nature. He's a spirit, he has a soul, and he has a body. Yeah. So when what is in your spirit begins to, you know, it's like diffusion. When it comes from a place of higher concentration to a place of lower concentration, when that transition happens, it starts to infuse your soul. And the more your soul has, you know, of God, yeah. it starts to translate in the body. So it, it, it no longer becomes something you have to force yourself to do you realize that a passion starts to grow yeah. in your soul. And whatever is abundant in the soul, it, it becomes natural. Bro, so that, the, that, that transition has to happen in the life of every believer. You know, I, I please, I cajole you, I, whatever word Please. you can use, I beseech you, be as mechanical as you can be. Wow. Be as mechanical as you can be. If you need to set a, an alarm, you need to, you know, pray every hour. You need to pray at 12 o'clock. So. It won't always be so. Because your relationship with God is not strictly based on your one hour of prayer. Yeah. Because so basically, hear this. So it comes from unconscious incompetence, mm -hmm. right, to a conscious competence. Yeah. And ultimately arrives at unconscious competence. Mm -hmm. I'll say it again. It begins from unconscious incompetence. You don't even know you have a problem. You don't even know you don't pray. You don't even know you are not spiritually healthy. You don't even know if there is a God. Because the scripture says that the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So you, you are still a fool. Because you don't even understand God at his basis essence. Because the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom can begin. Hallelujah. So he says that. So it begins from unconscious incompetence. You don't even know you have a problem. Generates and grows into conscious competence where you are 
doing it mechanically, you are going to church, you are writing down notes and all of these stuff, you are, you know, setting alarms to pray and all of that. Mm -hmm. And then it arrives at unconscious competence mm -hmm. where you do what you do without necessarily it being mechanical, mm -hmm. just like you were saying. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, we need to move, you know, quickly. Sure. So beyond having a great foundation, because if the foundation of the righteous is destroyed, scripture says, what can the righteous do? So there must be a foundation and that must be prayer, you know, fasting, all of these things are foundational elements. But as we begin to grow in God, the plan of God is never to build an individual. I always say that in all of my teachings, the plan of God is to build a family. That's why the, the, the name of uh, the ministry which I had is the New Nation Family. Because the plan of God is not to build an individual. The plan of God has always been to build a family. God is always in progression, like I said. He's the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. In him we live, we move, and have our being. There's a progression in God. We. The plan of God is to build a family. And that births the brotherhood. And the brotherhood is the strength of every, every priesthood. A calling, priesthood, and all these things, I feel is the, the zenith of our journey with God. Um, yeah. Is the zenith of that. And like I said, your relationship has to transition to an organic phase. And it is that in that organic phase that, you know, we started, certain things started to begin to birth in our spirit. Responsibility. Responsibility is birthed out of that. You know, uh, it's, it's not something you just decide to do. You know, there's something that happened. There's one very famous guy, famous guy in the world, very famous guy. I won't call his name so that I don't get cancelled on YouTube. Very famous guy. Famous, as famous as famous can get. Was married to one of the most beautiful, in quote, women in the world. He was, uh, was in the world for so many years and all of that. And then, boom, he said he gave his life to Christ, became a pastor. Immediately. He immediately became a pastor. Started holding Sunday service. Men of God started inviting him to their churches, of course, mm -hmm. latching onto his clout and all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But today, the gentleman is nowhere to be found. Mm -hmm. No, so it, it, it can't just happen like that. You can't just get into God, get into Christ, and then boom, you have responsibility. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen. You don't give birth to a child and then give them the key of your car to drive. It doesn't work. So the calling is, like you said, it's the zenith of our work with God. When you begin to work with God, God begins to entrust you little by little, you know, with priesthood, with brotherhood, and then you arrive at a calling. But God gives the calling even when you are young. So he says, for to Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 1, since you were formed in your mother's womb, mm -hmm. while he was still within the cutaneous tissues of his mother's womb, God had already placed a calling in him. So even when you come into Christ, you might feel, I want to do this, I want to do this. Listen, the calling is there. But there's a process. We'll talk about that with Femi. There's a process. Mm -hmm. There's an advent into mm -hmm. maturity. It's called adoption. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about that process. Your relationship with God. Yeah. It is from that relationship that, you know, it builds into a calling. You know, and like I said, it has to be organic. So uh, what a calling is, is a responsibility. And mm -hmm. that responsibility has a duty, it has an election, it has an office. And uh, three topics. as you are building, you know, organically, I have to s emphasize on this, as you are building organically, because you cannot force a calling. Ooh, like I, I said, say, uh, you don't... Labor. Somebody shout amen. <laughs> you, you don't choose. You don't choose, you don't choose what, what you would... You don't choose your calling. You don't choose your calling. You don't choose your calling. You don't choose... Uh, what resources should be at your disposal. This is, this is what your work with God is. It's a journey of adjustment. As you are learning, as you are growing, God tells you what you need to do. But and he doesn't force you. No, he doesn't force you. But your love for him compels is what compels you to, choose. to do the things that he wants you to do. I always say this, if God will compel you, you will comply, but you will never choose. He's the God of all the earth. Scripture says that if you don't worship him, he, he has the capacity to raise stones mm. to do that. But man has a will. Yeah. The fact that you have a calling doesn't mean you fulfill it. Mm -hmm. And that's right. The fact that you are called of God, blessed, gifted, equipped by the power of the Spirit, does not mean that you will. Jesus says that, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but I will be done. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. So Jesus could have started Jesus' resurrection ministries upon the earth. But he says, not my will, your will, what? 
be done. So God can compel you. If he compels you, you will comply. Because he had in the heart of Pharaoh. If God compels you, you will comply. But you will never choose. Yeah. So God wants us to arrive at a choice. Mm -hmm. To say that this is the way I will walk in it. So you enroll for the school of the calling yourself. Mm -hmm. And let's begin that phase mm -hmm. as we end the, the, the podcast. Mm -hmm. The calling, mm -hmm. it's the core, like you said, the zenith of what we do at the end of the day. Even many people who become Christians want to become like, you know, Nathaniel Bass, you want to become like, you know, Pastor Ching Tuck, want mm -hmm. to become like great people. They, they, it's, and it's normal to follow through, to follow them who through faith and patience obtain the promise. So what we find in the body of Christ is imitation. I mean, I was at one of my brother's um, programs, Hillary, and there was a lady that came to minister, I forgot her name, and oh my God, while she was ministering, all I could see was sumisola. All I could hear was like she had swallowed Sumisola, her tongues, the way she, her mannerisms, the way she moves on stage, her riffs and runs, it was exactly the same. So I see that people on the road to calling go through the school of imitation. So how do we, how do we transition from imitation to who, who we actually are in God? That's the beauty of the brotherhood. Um, the brotherhood is a community, a family, a household of faith that, you know, helps us, you know, to do the things that we actually need to do. And in the event of wanting to execute what God will have us do, many times we find ourselves, you know, borrowing from, you know, our brothers. Yeah. You know, so it's, 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 it's not, it might not, it might not necessarily be a conscious thing. But if I'm naturally in an environment where I have people like Femi and people like, it is natural. I found myself in a place where I was venturing into unfamiliar terrain. And because I had a brother who, who was so familiar with that terrain, I found myself naturally inclining to, you know, what he would normally do. So that means I found myself in a place where I would do the things that he would naturally do. Yeah. So the, the spiritual roaming. It is. You can plug into another network. So I wouldn't necessarily call it imitation, but I, I would say that it's natural, you know, for you to express yourself that way if you're in an environment. There's a certain church in Nigeria. Yes. All the pastors look like the man of God. Yes. I mean, skull, the same color of suit. I mean, even the way they walk, the way they talk, yes. is the same. And that's not just one ministry. It's, it happens in, it's the way it is. Mm -hmm. People look like what they follow and they look like what they eat. Mm -hmm. They look like what they consume. So that imitation like you're talking about, it is it's inherent, it's natural, it happens. But there must be a point where you, you, you stop being an echo and you find your voice. Yeah. You see, when I was coming in, I began to, I used to teach like a lot of people. I used to teach like, ooh. Everybody I listen to, this Sunday I taught like this man of God, this next Sunday I, I taught like this man of God, this next Sunday, you know. But at this point I am, I found my voice, you know, I'm, I'm David O'Carroll and I'm who I am. There's nothing you can do about it. My convictions are solid, they are crystallized. You know, I'm not about to, you know, fluctuate. I'm steady. There's something my pastor always says, those who walk on in the light, they never stumble nor fall. So I've come to a place where I know who I am in God and I have my own voice. How does someone who is still imitating, find your voice. For example, you, you sing your own songs. Ezra has, I mean, almost 30, more than 30 songs already written, has an album already out, has another one coming out as well. You, you, you've been able to culture your own sound. You know, you culture your own sound. You, you are able to vibrate on an atmosphere that heaven has designated to you. There are people that when they minister, all they sing is other people's songs. It's not a bad thing to sing other people's songs. But how do you get to the point where you trust your own sound? You trust your own teaching. You trust your own message. You trust the voice of God in your ears. How do you get to that point? Intimacy. Intimacy. Um, I will say that your voice also comes from clarity. Clarity of the things that God will have you do. He's both um, I, I, I had to grow to this point. And it is through the journey of intimacy that naturally birthed the things that you are hearing today. So it's not a forced process. I, I feel like a lot of people, once they get into the faith, they just want to rush and do something for God. And I want to make it known to you that 
I'm doing the things I'm doing today, not because I even necessarily saw myself doing them, yeah. but in my journey of intimacy, they came out so naturally. And having clarity in the things that God will have me do, that's where my voice came from. Oof. There's a line, there's a line in your song. There's a line in your song. You said, you say, breathe on us as we pray. Yeah. Let the light of your word shine on us. Yeah. Can you explain that line? Breathe on us as we pray. Breathe on us as we pray. And let the light from your word shine on us. A, a lot of the things that people see and exalt uh, are things that God, only God can do. So when they, I'll speak, I'll speak for myself. This is this where they say Nigeria are gay. <laughs> oh Lord, come on. A lot of the things I notice that cause people to say yes is not necessarily what I said, but the frequency at which that is being communicated. Like I said, you have a spirit, you have a soul, and you have a body. So through prayer and through you know spiritual activities, when I engage my spirit, I find that resources from God or of God or God's nature, when it finds its way in my, in my soul, that naturally translates. And when I'm able to communicate that, that is what causes the, ah, oh, yes, yeah, it's not necessarily a response to what I said, but the energy level that is available in my soul, the resources that heaven has, you know, placed in my soul. Like now, you may not necessarily remember what I said, yeah. but what was being transmitted through that communication? Like I've been saying, through that intimacy, there are things that naturally happen. I, I, I've heard stories of people like Catherine Kuhlman, for yeah. example, and there were stories of where she walked into, you know, walked through an airport and, you know, people would just naturally start manifesting. I don't think that this is something she intended to do. But, you know, her, her relationship with God has grown to a level where the energy level. See, we are getting too mystical now. <laughs> we are talking about chakra and all of these things. These things we can talk about in, when we are in church, when we are doing Sunday service, okay? Now, the thing is, we talked about all of that. That calling mm -hmm. is manifested through a body, and we're ending the, the podcast here. The, the calling is mani manifested through a body. So I will we'll just do five minutes on that. Mm -hmm. Because your body is not a, it's not, it's not a hundred percent at every time. You know, you, you, there are things that plague the body. Jesus rested. Jesus wept. Jesus was hungry. It, it was, it's all in scripture. It's the life and ministry of Jesus. You know, we talked about ministry, growing in God, but there's, there's something that plagues us and that is the body because the spirit can be so here and the body hasn't caught up. The body hasn't caught up. We're talking about addictions. We're talking about passions. You're talking about, you know, the wrong you know, inclinations. And that's not because you are not a new creature. It's just because the body, like we talked about, hasn't caught up. So you can be functioning in your calling, functioning in your gift, functioning in all of that. And many times, the body shows up. The body shows up and you naturally feel like, mm, I'm not so called. I'm not so anointed. But scripture says that your body is presented as a living sacrifice, meaning this sacrifice is being presented, but this sacrifice is very alive. Mm. <laughs> your body is alive. It has a mind of its own. It has a spirit of its own. <laughs> Hallelujah. So whenever you find yourself in that conundrum, please understand that you are a living sacrifice. You present your body. Even if it comes alive, present it again. Paul says, I bury my flesh on that daily. Can you just talk on that? I think you've you highlighted that beautifully. I mean, presenting your body as a living sacrifice. Um, there is a point where you feel overwhelmed. Yeah. And, you know, recently uh, there was a song that was just, you know, bubbling in my sing it, spirit. Sing it, sing it, sing <laughs> it. No, I won't sing it, but I'll say the line. It says, uh, when I grant your presence, when my soul is seeking refuge. Okay. You know, so... I feel like throughout the journey of faith, we will find ourselves in seasons where our soul will need to seek refuge. And it is in those seasons when we are so overwhelmed, uh, we, are, you know, we, are, we are contemplating on so many things, there's so much happening in the world, that there's a possibility for your soul to be overwhelmed. Yeah. And 
the psalmist also gave us that secret. You know, you can submit your your soul to God. You can seek refuge in God. Yeah. You know, when I look to God, He helped me. So, um, like you said it beautifully, offering your your body, body as a living living sacrifice. living sacrifice. I'm not saying that you will not be tempted. I'm not saying that you will not, you know, suffer the things that are common to man. But what I'm saying is that there is an avenue for God to help, for God to intervene. There's something you said to me some years ago as we close on this. A good preacher closes at least three times. You know, as we close, that's the first one. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> but you said to me, there's no one who has ever asked help of God and God has refused help. That changed my life. You know, we want to be so independent. You see, I was in Nigeria a couple of months ago. One of my cousins wants to, he's just 14 years old. He wants to leave his father's house and just start working and be independent. There's a rush, a rage to be independent as it were. You know, why is that so that we are trying so hard to be independent when the plan of God is actually to, to make us dependent on him? As we grow in him, we are supposed to become more dependent. Jesus was not so independent. He was so dependent on the Father. I only do what I see the Father do. So we are competent, but we submit that competence to God. So in terms of our body now, we need to come to a place where it's clear that we have an infirmity. Paul calls it for, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. You know, there's an infirmity. But the Holy Ghost helps our infirmity. So like you said, there's no man that has ever asked God for help mm -hmm. and God has refused help. Mm -hmm. Why would we find it so difficult to ask God? When you are, in, you are in this something, you're struggling with something, it's difficult. I mean, we'll talk about marriage in another episode. You know, even in your marriage, in my marriage, I was, I was really, things were really hard. And I said to God, help me. If not, by this time tomorrow, I will not be married. <laughs> you know, I, I was very straight with him. Help me. See, oh, if you don't help me, oh, 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 you understand? Sometimes you have to be that open. You have to be vulnerable to receive help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's powerful. That's, <laughs> that's powerful. If we don't stop it there, we don't end the broadcast. So this is my brother Ezra. This is the new conversation with your host, David Akawa. Amazing to have you here. Ezra is having his album out within the next couple of weeks. You definitely hear sound of it. It will be incredible. You just need to hear the sounds. I know it doesn't look like it doesn't look like like someone who can ventilate in the spirit, but if you see him at the peak of his priesthood, that's what the calling does. It turns you into another man. Hallelujah. Um, I, I pray to God. I always want to pray at the end of every episode that the just like he said in the song that as we pray. He will breathe on you and the light from his word will shine on you. And when he shines on you, he shines on your path because darkness is not the absence of light. It is the obstruction of it. So anything that seems to have obstructed light and casted a shadow upon your path, we pray that by the power of the spirit, even now it is cleared forth. Everything that you have struggled with, everything that seems like your body cannot overcome, hear me by the power of the Spirit. Flood your spirit with the light of God and you will see those chains break off. You will see limitations, addictions. Just move off and fall off like it's nothing. The Lord bless you and keep you until we see you again. This is the new conversation. And cut.